you got out of bed this morning, did you think to yourself, I'm going to practice good safety habits today? Odds are you didn't. Yet most of us practice some good safety habits at some point every day. We wear seat belts, we keep our hands and feet clear of lawnmower and snowblower blades. We make sure we have working smoke alarms. We do it because we've learned to practice safety. We do it because we want to protect ourselves and the people around us. Why should it be any different at work? Just like at home, the workplace is full of potential hazards, even more so. But as long as you're aware of those hazards and take the proper precautions, you can protect against them. The good news is there are a lot of people concerned about your safety at work. Our government has an agency that focuses on employee safety, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. OSHA was formed back in 1970 to develop and enforce job safety and health standards. Your company values your safety. You wouldn't be participating in this training session if they didn't. They've implemented protections and controls to ensure your workplace meets OSHA safety standards and you have a safe work environment. But nobody can keep you safe without your cooperation. It's up to you to know how to identify hazards, how to avoid or eliminate them, and report hazards and unsafe conditions so people you work with stay safe as well. Before we get to the specifics on how to do that, let's make a quick check of your safety mindset. If you saw your coworker stacking boxes like this, what would you do? Of course, you'd steer clear of the hazard. And you should also take steps to make sure someone else doesn't end up under that heavy pile of boxes. Point out the problem to your coworker so he can fix it. Maybe even offer to help. Pardon the unavoidable pun, but safety doesn't happen by accident. Even if safety isn't the first thing you think of when you wake up in the morning, it needs to be on your mind throughout the day. You have to think about safety, to choose to be safe and to take responsibility to protect yourself and your coworkers. Let's look at what that means. We'll cover work practices, the work environment, the safe use of equipment, and what to do in case of an emergency. Everything you see here may not relate directly to your specific job assignment, but it will help you get into a safety first frame of mind. Practices are a combination of learned behaviors, routines, and habits. And you know as well as I do, there are good habits and there are bad habits. Your employer wants to make certain your safety habits are good ones. Setting up your workstation ergonomically is a start. That simply means you should make adjustments to your workstation where possible to fit your body so you don't have to move in awkward or uncomfortable ways. Some quick examples, raise or lower your chair, or adjust the distance you have to reach for supplies. This helps prevent an injury that might occur if you had to repeatedly strain and stress to complete everyday work tasks. There's a good chance your company's safety team can help you with the specifics. The parts of your body most vulnerable to stress and strain are your hands, wrists, arms, shoulders, back, and legs. Repetitive motion injuries can happen if you repeat the same movement over and over. Even simple movements can be harmful over time. If you feel any pain, numbness, or joint stiffness, 
or if you know of a better way to perform your job that avoids repetitive motion, talk with your supervisor about it. Make it a habit to avoid long periods of repetitive twisting and forceful or flexing motions while you work. If you can't avoid it, do yourself a favor. Stretch periodically and use good posture. Talk to your supervisor about taking frequent breaks. Along those same lines, if your job involves lifting, do it right. Know the maximum weight limits for manual lifting in your job and use proper lifting techniques. Test the weight of the load before you lift by moving one of the corners. Split larger loads into smaller, more manageable ones. And get help with large loads, whether from another person or material handling equipment. If the load is heavy and you're planning to pull or push rather than lift it, pushing is usually best. You're generally able to push about two times the weight you can pull. Of course, when you're lifting, bend at the knees and let your legs do the work, not your back. Keep the load as close to your body as possible. And whatever you do, don't twist your back while lifting. Set the load down by bending at the knees. Don't take unnecessary chances when lifting. You could end up with an injury, a lousy way to put the wrap on a workday. Are you someone who likes a clean work area? If so, that's great, because it's important to keep work areas clean to prevent accidents. Workstations, storage areas, passageways, and stairways should be kept free of obstacles that could cause slips and trips, injuries, or fire hazards. Materials should be stored the right way. Be sure stacked materials are stable. The last thing you want to do is create a hazard. Collect and dispose of waste properly in containers with lids and throw away glass and other sharp objects in approved containers. This is a lockout device, and this is a tag, and you need to respect them. If you're not familiar with lockout tagout devices, take the initiative to know what they are and what they look like. Lockout devices and tags are used when equipment or machinery is being serviced or maintained. They protect you from accidental exposure to energized equipment or circuits. Lockout devices block the flow of energy from a power source so equipment won't accidentally release energy or start up. The energy being blocked could be from any number of sources, including mechanical, electrical, hydraulic, steam, or even gravity. Tags warn others not to restore energy to the lock or tagged power source. In the case of electrical energy, both a lockout device and a tag are used if possible. Lockout tagout affects everyone who comes in contact with energy powered machinery and equipment, although only certain workers are qualified to apply lockout tagout devices. Any affected employee must be notified before lockout tagout devices are applied and again after they're removed. If you value your life, don't ignore lockout tagout devices and never remove them either. Only an authorized individual is allowed to do that. Let's look at the work environment itself. It's true, there are potential hazards everywhere, but you can avoid them. Let's review how. The first hazard on our list, slips, trips, and falls. People slip, trip, and fall in workplaces every day, sometimes resulting in serious injuries. Slips may be caused by wet surfaces, spills, or weather-related hazards like ice or snow. Trips can easily result from uneven rugs, loose tiles, cords, hoses, even friction between your shoes and the floor. 
Slips and trips can also happen if you wear shoes without adequate traction or when you don't pay attention to where you're walking. Obviously, you're more likely to slip or trip when you're in a hurry. So slow down. Looking out for the culprits that cause slips and trips, along with the falls and injuries that can result, will help you avoid them. Spills need to be cleaned up right away. Any loose flooring, carpeting, and the like need to be reported so they can be repaired. You can also do simple things like keep work areas and walkways free of clutter. Eliminate extension cords located in walkways. If you can't, use extension cord protectors. Take care so that you can see over any load you're carrying. It just makes sense, right? Chemicals are another common hazard source you may encounter during your workday. When you do, you have a right to know what the chemicals are, how to protect yourself, and how to respond to emergency situations. That information is communicated to you in a number of ways as part of OSHA's hazard communication standard. A key hazard communication source is the Safety Data Sheet, or SDS. You'll find these sheets in your workplace for any dangerous chemicals present. Every hazardous chemical in your workplace needs to have an SDS, and it needs to be readily accessible to all employees. Ask your supervisor where SDSs are located in your facility. An SDS describes a chemical's physical properties and how to safely handle it. If you work with chemicals, you can check the SDS for the necessary personal protective equipment. It's also a good idea to check the SDS to see what first aid treatment is needed if you or someone else is exposed and how to respond to incidents like spills and fires. Container labels that identify chemicals and provide hazard warnings are another form of hazard communication. Don't worry, you won't be on your own if you work with chemicals. Part of hazard communication is employee awareness training. If your job involves exposure to chemical hazards, your employer must provide you with the information and training you need before you work with chemicals of any kind. Electrical hazards are something you want to keep your distance from, unless you're a trained and qualified electrician. Stay away from exposed electrical components and barricaded areas where electricians are working. The fact is, it doesn't take much electricity to cause an injury. Typical household current can be more than enough to kill someone. The main thing to know about electricity? Leave electrical problems to the professionals, the people who've had specialized training to work on or near exposed energized parts. Don't create electrical problems either. Some common sense rules to follow are to make sure your hands are dry when you use electricity and to inspect tools and cords before you use them. Don't use extension cords for anything except temporary needs. They can become pinched or severed over time, creating the potential for electrocution. Don't use cords that have missing third prongs. They're not grounded, meaning they could cause a shock or worse. And don't strain extension cords in any way. It can create dangerous weak points that can harm you and the equipment the cord is plugged into. One last word on electrical safety. Electricity is a prime cause of workplace fires and explosions, especially if there's old wiring, worn insulation, or broken electrical fittings. Help keep your workplace safe by reporting these hazards immediately. As this fire triangle illustrates, fires can only occur if three ingredients are present, oxygen, heat, and fuel. The key to fire prevention is to keep these three ingredients separate. Some practical things you can do to help prevent fires include keeping storage areas free of trash and placing oily rags in covered containers. Also, take extra precaution when handling flammable or combustible liquids, or LP gas. If you smoke, 
do so only in designated smoking areas. If a fire does occur, remain calm but act quickly because fires can spread rapidly. Exit immediately, cover your face if you can, stay low and sound the alarm on your way out. Even if the blaze looks like something you could extinguish, your employer may not want you to. That's because different fires need to be extinguished differently. And if you don't have the proper training, you could actually make matters much worse. Let me give you an example. If you attempt to extinguish an electrical fire with a water type extinguisher, the electrical current can follow the water stream and electrocute you. The point is, when a fire occurs, follow your company's emergency action plan and only attempt to extinguish a fire if you're properly trained. Once you're outside, move away from the building as quickly as possible to your prearranged meeting area. Check in right away with the person in charge for an accurate head count. If you'll be working in confined spaces like tanks, ducts, pipelines, and the like, you'll get specialized safety training. Confined spaces can harbor toxic or flammable contaminants, or they might not have enough oxygen, making them extremely dangerous. OSHA requires employers to have detailed procedures, including an entry permit system, before any employee can enter a permit-required confined space. Unless you're a trained, authorized entrant, never enter a confined space. If you are trained to work in confined spaces, it's critical to follow your company's procedures to the letter. And if you work near confined spaces, obey signs that identify these dangerous places. Don't attempt to rescue someone in a confined space unless you're trained to do so. More than half of confined space fatalities are would-be rescuers. In areas where hazardous materials, chemicals, equipment, or processes are present, certain types of hazard warning signs may need to be posted. Know what the signs mean, and more importantly, follow them. Danger signs, which are predominantly red, white, and black, warn about immediate hazards. Caution signs, predominantly yellow and black, warn about potential hazards and unsafe practices. Exit signs.